speaker will be introduced by uh, Damien Hooper Campbell, who is uh, eBay's first chief diversi diversity officer and has deep expertise as an agent of change within the technology and finance industries, nonprofit sector, and academia. He's responsible for leading the design and implementation of eBay's strategy for embedding diversity and inclusion across global workforce, workplace, and marketplace. He also leads eBay's recruiting, uh, university recruiting and program teams. Ladies and gentlemen, Damien Hooper Campbell. Can we give it up for this gentleman, please? Just one more time, thank you for your leadership and, and investment. <clears throat> so, my name is Damien Hooper Campbell. I joined as eBay's first Chief Diversity Officer a year and a half ago. I was on a panel um, earlier this week, and the moderator, we were talking about inclusion in tech, and the moderator said, if you had to come up with a title, a book title, of diversity and inclusion in Silicon Valley right now, what would it be? And I thought about it. And mine was something to the extent of, what a time to be alive, what a time to be doing diversity and inclusion work. And then as I left that panel, I started to think about it and I said, so yeah, we've made some progress, right? We definitely have across the world, right? Australia just announced news, right, of, um, of, of approval of same-sex marriages. But at the same time, this year, we had issues in all parts of the United States around, around the transgender community, right? At the same time, in Turkey, just recently, the governorship banned any non-government organized LGBTQA events. And so we still have work to do. And I thought about it and I said, so I'm lucky to be doing this work right now and I can speak up, but how did that happen? And I dialed it back and started to think about all the people who were courageous when maybe it wasn't physically safe, maybe it wasn't professionally safe, maybe it wasn't psychologically safe, to be courageous. That is why I'm so excited to be introducing our honored guest tonight because as many of you know, Santa Clara County Supervisor Ken Yeager is somebody who was courageous way back in the day. I think many of you know his bio already, but I'll just highlight a couple of the points that I know. So what I do know is that you came to uh, the Valley or to the South Bay um, at the age of 18 right, um, to, as a freshman, San Jose State University, right? And then in 1984, helped to co-found the LGBTQ-focused political action community or, or political action committee, BAMAC, right? That still exists today. And then 20 years later, made history as the first openly gay elected official in Santa Clara County. Now, that's awesome. What I also found to be interesting, but not surprising, is that Ken is a former marathon runner. And Ken now participates heavily in Spartan, right? Spartan-focused or themed races, intense races. And so this is somebody who has been fighting the fight for a long time and continues to fight it in both his professional and personal life. And so without any further ado, it's an honor to have you here at eBay, ladies and gentlemen, Ken Yeager. Well, thank you, Damien. I want you to know you really should thank him a lot because he just cut my speech by about 10 minutes <laughs> with other things that I was going to mention, but now I don't have to. But thank you all for coming here. Really, this is a, a great treat for me. I was sort of curious. I was talking to Yos and trying to remember how it, it, it all came about that he asked me to come and sort of talk about my life here in Santa Clara County. And as some of you know, if you are on my email list, you uh, get to see some of the pieces that I've done talking about some of the historic events that have happened in the community down here. I think a lot of, a lot of people devalue LGBTQ history. 
you know, we know about a lot about other things, but we don't do a very good job about recording our own history, and it really is phenomenal. It's sort of as Damien was saying, from where we were 30, 40 years, years ago to where we are now is, is amazing, amazing when you think of the struggles that a lot of minority groups had to go through. And so he thought it would be important for, for me to sort of capture my history and to present it uh, in a form like this. So you, know, you, get, you get all the credit or the blame, whatever, whatever you want to take uh, for being here. So uh, we are going to talk a little bit about my history. I should say that while I'm doing that, there's the uh, time frame that is happening somewhere uh, as soon as they do that. So it uh, sort of talks about some of the, the, the big historic events that are occurring as well as some of the ones that are local. So I know that as I sort of talk about this history, there's a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, and some of the people here in the room have been through that journey, and I'll uh, point some of them out as we go along. But uh, the first thing we're going to show is a video of my uh, introducing the concept of an LGBTQ office for, this, uh, for, for the county. And so it's going to be me uh, at the Board of Supervisors proposing this and trying to get the support of my fellow colleagues to support it. And um, I think uh, I was caught a little off by surprise by my reaction as I was talking, and I'll sort of mention why I thought um, I ended up sort of being so emotional. So it's, it's a very short tape. Thank you, President Cortese. I'm very pleased um, to put forward the proposal to create an Office of LGBT Affairs. While the LGBT community has traditionally been underrepresented in government and underserved by institutions, this county has a long tradition of working to eliminate disparities among its residents. And uh, there are many, many people uh, inside the county that I have been able to work with and certainly led by um, Dr. Smith in trying to reduce those disparities. And, and, and from my heart, I really appreciate all that they have done. Now I'm gonna get choked up. <laughs> um, an Office of LGBT Affairs could provide staff training, external relations to the LGBT community, resource development, and evaluation. Its goal would be to provide leadership, accountability, and effective outcomes. Take your time, Supervisor. Thank you. <laughs> I wasn't quite expecting this. We love you. <laughs> well, I was getting choked up, uh, Gabrielle, when you f were first talking. Um, because I remember, you know, the Billy DeFrank Center 30 years ago um, in a storefront on Keys. And, um, you know, we've all come so far. <sighs> so I won't go th through the pain of watching me trying to get through that introduction. But, but certainly I've, I've sort of, I, mean, I couldn't have been more surprised and certainly tears of joy. But I think for... For all of us who have been struggling for so long, working so hard, you know, with all of the losses, with all of the negativity, and to be presenting something that was so positive and having so much support from everybody uh, just made me well up. And so, but I'm glad to report that despite uh, how poorly I did that, the Board of Supervisors uh, approved it at a five to zero. And I'll talk a little bit later, but we, now we do have this Office of LGBTQ Affairs. <laughs> So people often, you know, I, I think ask people who are in government, well, how did you get started? You know, how, how did this all come about? And the answer that I give them is that it all started when I ran for seventh grade president. <laughs> and won. I've only lost one election, but I did not uh, lose that election. Not really quite sure what got me involved in, in politics or running. I sort of have to credit or blame my mother, who probably came up with the idea. And I remember sitting around the kitchen table, uh, cutting up all these little signs that people, you know, buttons that people would wear on their shirt, you know, vote for Ken, um, other uh, little sort of mottos that I'll uh, escape and not, not tell you about. But anyway, it was successful and that was the fun. In school, I was never, uh, athlete at all. That's just not the route I took. It was student government and journalism, two things that uh, actually worked out pretty well in my adult life as I got older. But I grew up in Riverside, California, a small conservative Republican town. 
uh, east of Los Angeles, about 60 miles, uh, far enough that LA had actually no bearing on my life whatsoever or on the social community in Riverside. And like, you know, like a lot of gay people, that I, I had a sense that I was gay at, at, a, at a pretty young age. I also knew that um, being gay in Riverside just was not going to work out. And I think one of, the, one of the things I'm so glad about the gay rights movement has been that in a lot of cities, it, you, you can stay in that town and you can get to know your family, and you can make a life there rather than having to leave to go to bigger metropolitan towns where you, again, you sort of lose that family connection. But I knew I couldn't stay in Riverside, so at the tender age of 18, up to San Jose State I go, 400 miles, that was about the right distance so the parents couldn't drop by unexpectedly. I think we all know that feeling. And um, major in, in political science. At the time, San Jose State had a very good internship program. I think all of us that were in college were sort of wondering, well, how do we you know, get to know people in the field that we want? And a lot of, of course, people in tech you know, do internships. I did my internships at City Hall and worked for a number of uh, elected officials, for city council people. Uh, almost always worked for women, because I certainly felt that with the, with the women's movement, the feminist movement, and as sort of those sexual stereotypes you know, began to uh, fade, that that was going to make it easier for LGBT people as well. I sort of s saw this, the same stereotypes that were on women were also for us in trying to really show that with uh, electing women, they could really sort of make a difference, see women in positions of power. This was at a time when very few women were in elected office. And then there's a picture of me here with uh, Congressman uh, Don Edwards. He was the local congressman for a number of years. I worked for him here and then also in Washington, D.C. as his press secretary and then uh, came back here. I think as you uh, see the timeline that's happening, uh, in, um, so St Stonewall happens in 69. Here it is now in 1977. The gay rights movement is beginning to take hold. There are folks that are putting on gay pride uh, events and marches, and so it's really beginning uh, to pick up a little bit. One of the things that the early activists realized is that there were no laws prohibiting discrimination against LGBT people, that you could fire them, you could not give them uh, housing, really you could do whatever you wanted, because there just weren't any laws. And I think some people, maybe younger people, think that these rights are somehow given that they're just sort of automatic and everybody has to, you know, not discriminate against people. But, of course, that's not true when you think of the women's um, uh, struggles and African-American. You need to get laws passed that prohibit it. But because it was almost impossible to get it done at the state level, it was done at the local level. And one of the very first and most well-known cities that did it, although it's a city county, Miami, Dade, Cade County, Florida. And so they passed this non-discrimination bill that said you couldn't discriminate based uh, in, in housing and, and uh, employment based on sexual orientation. And Anita Bryant, one of the people who had a big impact on my life, who would have thought Anita Bryant would have a big impact on my life, was, was so against this. She's a, a very strong Christian woman. She was a runner-up on Miss America, and she was the spokesperson for Florida Orange Juice. And she really just saw, you know, saw uh, homosexuality as a menace. And she created this group called Save Our Children. Save Our Children from Homosexuals. And it really gave a whole rise to the religious right movement, to people like Jerry Falwell, who at that point nobody had ever heard of. And that uh, this, you know, the religious right began to sort of realize that this is a hot political topic that will get them followers and get them money and enable them to get people elected to office. And they were very successful. There were a variety of, of cities that had um, uh, passed similar ordinances, and each one of them they slowly were overturned. In San Jose, the gay rights movement sort of is beginning, beginning to take hold. Uh, there was a very early march here. Uh, the San Jose City Council had voted for a gay proclamation. This is in 1978. And the response back from the religious right was so strong, it's just really quite amazing, a week later, a week later, they took a vote and rescinded it. 
I mean, that was sort of the atmosphere that was, that was t t taking hold. It isn't until 1987, 11 years later, it took 11 years for the San Jose City Council to then finally adopt a resolution um, proclaiming gay pride in San Jose. And you'll see a picture down there. Uh, somebody I will mention throughout this entire talk is Wigsy. Wigsy and I are there with, uh, this was at the gay pride event with the proclamation that the city council finally approved. Well, as I was saying, a number of jurisdictions were passing these gay rights bills, if you will, saying you couldn't discriminate. And people here in San Jose decided that we needed to have this here as well. Now it's 1980. And you'll see a couple of the headlines here. So as the city council and the board of supervisors begin to discuss passing these type of ordinances, the religious right sort of emerges out of the mist in ways that absolutely nobody expected. I was uh, working for Supervisor Wilson at the time. I was in the building. He certainly knew of the support that the Board of Supers, Supervisors had for these type of ordinances. But the religious right really, again, saw it as a way to recruit people and to organize their own churches. And these are, we're talking about the mega churches that still exist, you know, with hundreds of people that go each Sunday. And so when the Board of Supervisors, who did it first before the city, was debating this, by the busloads, by the busloads, they would come and, um, and say, no, we don't want this, and put to, to protest. And this was, I think, a fascinating time in our history, and I do have some of the articles that I've written, so if you want more information about the A and B campaign, you can um, read it over there. So what they do is that they get out enough signatures to call for a referendum on these measures. Now, for those of you who aren't political science majors, you may not know exactly what a referendum is, but a referendum sort of puts on hold a, an ordinance that has been passed and makes the voters have to approve it. There's initiatives which you put on the ballot to, to enact a law, but referendums put it on hold. And so the choice that the voters had, as it um, says here, was, you know, shall these ordinances uh, become effective? And if you didn't want them effective, then you would vote no. I have to tell you, and I was around, and I know other people were as well, it was a terrible campaign. It was a terrible campaign with all the stereotypes that you can imagine about gay people. And I should say particularly about gay men. It was, don't let it spread. Don't let the sort of the homosexual lifestyle spread. And then you would have these photos, you know, that they would get and sort of saying, you know, enough is enough, no on A and B, keep it private. Just keep it private. And that if we're going to sort of have these type of ordinances, it's going to be then open in the public. The yes on A and B, which means that we wanted these to take place, did as good of a job as they could, but clearly they were just outnumbered and outspent. And so it was, their tagline was, live and let live, um, trying to then, trying to convince people that these were sort of basic human rights ordinances that should be passed. Well, it was a low point. Uh, I have to say, I mean, I've been doing this a long time, but this was a low point. Uh, the people who said, no, don't enact these, at the county level, 70%, and at the city side, 75%. And so maybe sort of even going back to a little bit what Damien was saying about how far we've come from how low we were. Can you imagine, you know, 75% of, of your city saying, no, you shouldn't have any rights at all? And so what's the message that is sent? Let's say you're an elected official. You're going to stay away from the gay rights movement. I mean, what, what possible value what, what, cap, what possible cap, political capital is there in supporting gay rights when you know 75% of the voters were not in support? Uh, I am out um, to some friends, but not out publicly. And uh, at that point, again, if you can sort of imagine how much fear there was that elected officials were even nervous about having an openly gay staff member because that could be used against them. You know, it could be a real sign that they were in support of gay rights. So time passes, it's now 1984, 
And one Sunday morning, I'm reading the San Jose Mercury News. I don't know how many people read the Sunday Mercury News anymore, but that's what you did back then. You didn't, you didn't go online. And this local assembly member from San Jose, uh, who had the odd name of Alistair McAllister, wrote this editorial that was in the paper. At that time, finally, the state, California state legislature had passed non-discrimination bills and sent to the governor. Duke Majin was the governor at the time. So it took until 1984 for this bill to sort of make it all the way to the governor in California. Because again, no, he didn't have those rights. And he was sort of saying, and it really was just a, a, a terrible uh, editorial, and it all had to do about sort of the homosexual lifestyle. That he saw this as something that was chosen. It wasn't innate, and that this was an a immoral decision that was being made, and so therefore it deserved no protection. It deserved no social status, it deserved no legal status, and it deserved no political status. Because this was a behavior that people did not have to perform, and if they did, they were being immoral, and why would you then want to give that kind of protection? Well, you know, I'm reading this, and I go, well, gosh, he's saying that I have, I have no legal, political, social standing in my community. I'd come up here to work, I'd try to contribute, and I said to myself, as many people do, Ken, if you don't fight for your rights, nobody else is. And I've talked to a lot of uh, openly gay, you know, gay people over time, asking them, when, when, was, when was the time they came out? And it's often when they were pushed to the brink and they weren't going to take it anymore. They were either been fired or they'd been harassed or if their lover had died and the lover's family came in, took all the possessions because they couldn't be legally married. Those kind of instances were the sort of the spark that said, that's it. And so I took a pen to paper because, you know, I did journalism in high school and decided then I would write this op-ed in response. And because he was so much talking about sort of the lifestyle and sort of the act of homosexuality, I was trying to say that that wasn't what gay people, LGBT people were at all. That here we were uh, trying to do the best job that we could, uh, working with the community, that people just wanted full equal rights so they could participate without fear and without retaliation from either their employer or the landlord at the time that they had. And so talk about love is blind for homosexuals as it is for heterosexual, no power on this earth is strong enough to reflect, ignore, or to legislate it. Because again, he saw homosexuality as, as totally something that people could do or not do. So that really enabled me to uh, come out publicly and then work on gay rights issues. And so now it's, it's still 1984, and I have a lot of background now. I mean, I've been doing politics here and campaigns, and so I sort of knew what I was doing, but knew I needed assistance. A good friend of mine at uh, San Jose State, a professor and mentor, Terry Christensen, connected me with uh, Wigsy Sievertson, who I knew of at San Jose State, and we decided what we really needed to do was to create a, uh, a political action committee, a, a uh, campaign committee that would support our causes and that we would get involved in politics. And so, uh, Wigsy's in the back of the room. Wigsy, where are you? Hey. She weaves uh, throughout this whole story from 1984 on here, but there's a picture of us uh, with uh, Congresswoman uh, Anna Eshoo at an event and some of the brochures that we did. And I want you to know that I spent a great deal of time sort of working to, to make a Baymax seem legitimate and to seem like it, it knew what it was doing because I didn't want it to fail. I, um, I've never been a particularly good speaker. I stuttered a lot as a kid, so it's taken a long time to be able to talk to a group. Uh, Wigsy, of course, has no problem talking to masses of people. So she was the, the spokesperson who would go out and rally up the crowd, and I was pretty much the one who wrote all the thank yous, did put the stamps on the envelopes, did a lot of the brochures, and all of that. So here we are, a political action committee, and lo and behold, what happens? We couldn't get 
elected officials to accept our endorsement, nor could we get them to even accept the checks. So here we have a local uh, assembly member who after they gets the checks, we get the check back, says, unfortunately, because of the sensitive nature and emotionalism surrounding AB1 and similar issues in my district, I do not feel that I am in a position to accept your contribution at this time. So these were the kinds of things that we were up against, really because of the defeat of measures A and B. Um, they didn't want our endorsement, they didn't want our money. We were able, I mean, I knew this was a problem because we wanted to send out a slate, you know, because people had sent us money, you know, for the people that we were endorsing. And we did have some uh, local people, John Vasconcellos, uh, Don Edwards, who, very staunch liberals, who really had absolutely no Republican opponent, that we begged them to uh, take the endorsement, which they were happy to do, just so we had some names on the questionnaire. Well, at this time, really starting in 81, but also about the same time, the tragedy of AIDS, HIV, the AIDS epidemic uh, begins to hit people. And so here we had absolutely no political standing, and now all of a sudden we're finding people becoming ill. A lot of uh, people nervous, not knowing how it spread. If, if you've been around during those times, could you get it, you know, um, from kissing, could you get it from hugging, could you get it from drinking faucets. People were getting sick. There was just a, a lot of concern, a lot of worry, a lot of panic. But again, also a political opportunity for our opponents. So now it's 1986. Uh, the other person who had a big influence in my life, rather than Anita Bryant, was Lyndon LaRouche. Lyndon LaRouche, some people know that name, sort of a political gadfly. He had tried to run for president, but he sort of seizes on the AIDS scare as something that can benefit him should he then ultimately want to run for governor in California. And so all of a sudden now we take AIDS sort of out of the, the medical side of things and put it into the political. And knowing how scared people are of, of AIDS, not really understanding how it's spread, he then says that uh, gay men really all need to be tested, and for people who are positive, they should be quarantined. And so this is, he got the signatures to do this, he, he bankrolled it, and it became then Proposition 64. And Wiggsy and I spent a lot of time on this, we had a lot of uh, activity, we sort of used it to organize uh, the gay community and work with that, and that sort of helped Baymac um, sort of get out there in the community and to sort of build our database. So we have a tough campaign, but we wanted to make sure that we were doing things here in San Jose, not just in San Francisco and Los Angeles. Santa Clara County, very much a moderate county at that time in San Mateo and Santa Cruz. And so we saw this really as a battleground that if uh, the, uh, the opponents uh, came in and worked really hard, we might lose this area, so we wanted to make sure that we had our own resources here. And as you see here, uh, Prop 64 failed, thankfully, 71% uh, against the initiative in, Calif in California, and 76% here in Santa Clara County. And I know that's one of those things that oftentimes, when voters don't have strong feelings about particular issues, may not give a group new rights, if you will, it's a different thing about sort of taking away somebody's rights. And I think that was a little bit here why so many people were opposed to it. I mean, just the whole idea of quarantining mass numbers, massive number of people um, was, was, uh, was not something they were willing to support, but it might be a little different about how they sort of felt about um, LGBT people having rights in general. So AIDS deaths in uh, Santa Clara County uh, continue. This is a chart up to 1994. Um, it was sort of the peak of the epidemic before uh, there's the medicine that is able to deal with a lot of the opportunistic diseases and HIV. So here we have now up to uh, 220 really young, vital people dying of AIDS. And I think all of us had many friends. It was a, it was a tough time. It, People seem to have gotten sick so quickly and declined so fast and sort of even before you knew it, they were in the hospital. And again, because of all the opportunistic diseases that were happening, they just didn't know how to treat everybody. And just a, a great deal of sadness and a great deal of people dying. But understanding that, again, we were trying to just get the facts out right so there wasn't the hysteria or the discrimination 
Um, and and the, the worst thing, too, is you wanted to make sure people went and got treatment, that they weren't scared that if they did that, somehow there was going to be bad repercussions or they weren't going to get treatment. So it worked very hard. At this time, the Board of Supervisors, the county, had not provided any general fund assistance for social services for people with AIDS. Certainly there are, you know, the, the county hospital and the clinics were, were treating people, but a lot of people had a lot of issues. People lost their jobs or they just couldn't work anymore. Housing, a lot of people lost their housing. There's still no um, li uh, laws that prohibited that kind of discrimination. People were sick, so they really couldn't continue on. So there began to be organizations that were created, but certainly needed support. And the county, I remember going before the Board of Supervisors along with Wigsy, as we take a package of things that we want to have have passed. One of the things that we asked for was we needed a task force to get all the people, all the players involved together so that we could sort of work on these issues. And the Board of Supervisors asked me if I would chair it, and I was glad to do it. So I'm in my early 30s at this point, still working uh, for elected officials, and it's not a bad job. But I said to myself, well, is this really what I want to do the rest of my life? And I said, no, you probably don't. So maybe some of you have had this experience when you're about that age trying to figure out what to do. What do you do? You go to grad school. <laughs> Let's just stall the final answer for a while and go to grad school. I was very fortunate to, to get accepted at Stanford uh, where I got my master's and loved it so much. I said, hey, what about a PhD? So they said, okay, it was all on their dime, so I didn't have to worry about uh, student uh, loans or any of that sort of stuff, uh, but had a good, good, good time there. But let's go back to 86 just for a second. So I certainly know a lot of people who become infected with HIV. And uh, a friend of mine that I knew uh, had been tested and was positive. And I said to myself, well, if, if he could become positive, I, I could as well. And so, Took, uh, took the antibody test. And for those of you who remember, it used to take two weeks. Two weeks before you got the results. And nowadays, of course, it's 20 minutes with the home test, and those can be agonizing 20 minutes. So two weeks, it was a, it was a, a pretty dreadful time. Fortunately, I, I, I was um, not positive, I was negative. And I sort of mentioned that because I want to scoot ahead for a little bit to 1989, three years later. It turns out that um, my dermatologist realizes that I have a stage three melanoma on my skin. Uh, it's a skin cancer. If it's stage four or five, uh, it's not looking good for you. And stage three is borderline. That can go either way. And I had the operation, had it removed, and then we just had to sort of see over time what was going to happen, and the melanoma never came back. But there were sort of the two health scares at the same time. And I think because I had gone through the nervousness about HIV, the melanoma scare didn't really bother me as much that, you know, it really might be curtains. I was sort of, sort of resigned. But I said to myself, if I make it through, there are two things I want to do. One of them was I wanted to quit smoking and start running because I wanted to run a marathon. Damien sort of mentioned that already. So thank you for that. And the second thing I said to myself, I want to see if I can win, run and win public office. So that's sort of where I get the idea of doing that. And so here you have uh, me running the Austin Marathon. I'm able to end up doing 33 marathons. So pretty proud of that. I don't run them at 3.33 anymore, but there I am. So I graduate and uh, get a teaching job at San Jose State. And which I love. It, it really meant a lot to me to be able to teach in the same classroom where I was a student. Really felt I sort of knew their story and what their situation was and taught political science and got people involved and did lots of stuff and, um, and really enjoyed it. But as a professor, I dealt with a lot of students who were transfer students from community colleges and saw some of the difficulties they were having academically and wondering if they needed to sort of strengthen some of their programs at the community college level. For whatever reasons, we elect our trustees to the community college board. And uh, so in my area, there wasn't an incumbent, someone who had served there had, 
had not run again. And in politics, it's easier to run for a vacant seat than to run against an incumbent. So in 1992, I run for community college board, and this is just some of the, uh, the brochures and the pictures that you see. And I have to say, with all of the experience, with all of the Baymet graphics and the photos and the writing and all that kind of stuff, really helped me design the pieces that I think, if I may so, say so humbly, as very effective. And so, you know, it's a, it's, it's, it's a lower ballot uh, office. So many people didn't know that I was gay. The signs, you can't tell them from here, were purple, sort of as a way to at least sort of give out that signal. And so as it turns out, six people, which is a, a lot of people, six people run for this office, and I get 49.9% of the vote. So I sort of overworked it, but that's okay. Leave as few things to chance as you can, but really, six people, 50, I get half of the vote. So that was very exciting, and there we go. Jaeger becomes our first openly gay elected official. So really, that uh, very is exciting. So four years later, uh, the incumbent from the assembly district that I live in uh, can't run because of term limits, and so I run for state assembly. Now, we've got to go back in time. Now, we're really very used to openly gay, lesbian people in the state assembly. I think now, I don't know, there's eight or ten. It's really quite amazing. But back then, zero, number was zero. The, the first uh, lesbians don't get elected to the state assembly in, until actually November of 96, when Sheila Kuehl and Carol Migdon get elected, and you don't get your first two gay men until two years later with John Laird, who is actually also on the Baymac board, and Mark Leno from San Francisco. So now we're but in 96, and so here we go here. This is, uh, again, some pieces of the, of the literature. We ended up putting in the running picture as a way to sort of, I know it sounds weird now, of, of showing that I'm healthy. Certainly people would have known that I was gay. We we're still at the height of the AIDS epidemic, so many people are becoming ill and sick. And so we sort of put that in saying that I'm a marathon runner, hopefully sort of sending you know, that message that I was healthy. Uh, well, so things move along. We're working hard. We raised $250,000. We run this campaign out of one of the uh, Billy DeFrank Center um, that they had on Stockton. We have 40 house parties. We have 400 volunteers. We have, all systems are going. I mean, I'm using everything that I know to try to win this election. And people are, are saying, Ken, it's looking good for you. It's looking good for you. So, lo and behold, we get this hit piece a week before the, um, the uh, election, all about how I have sort of a gay agenda. Um, my priorities are not the community's priorities. But if you put your families first, watch out for Ken Yeager. He's an ultra-liberal who fights for his agenda, not yours. And it just sort of stopped me in my tracks. How do you, how do you, how do you counter it? The, the more you sort of say, no, my, my values are the same as yours, you're sort of giving the message that people think that, that they're not. And I probably didn't respond very well. You know, we certainly worked harder than made more phone calls and that kind of stuff, but it's really hard to sort of fight when you have, when you're sort of dealing that you're not some, somebody who is, you know, anti, anti woman, anti child, anti family, and all you really care about is the homosexual agenda. So we didn't win. We didn't win my, uh, my first loss uh, going back to seventh grade. Uh, Mike Honda, who of course won the seat and then went on to Congress. Uh, years later, I come in second, get silver. Uh, Dave Cortese was the one who had done the hit piece. Um, and he and I had had uh, discussions afterwards and we've become um, close allies, close allies. He had a very young son at the time, life being one irony after another. Uh, that son is openly gay and Dave is very proud of him. But uh, anyway, and then uh, somebody else then came, came in fourth. So now it's sort of like my, my, I have a real curiosity about, well, how do gay people win office? And what do they do once they're there? And how are they successful? And what sort of issues do they work on? So I travel the country and I do these long profiles of openly gay people throughout the uh, country. At this point in time, nobody seems particularly interested in me. 
So I'm even more appreciative of Josh, of Jos, uh, to do this. So anyway, I include a chapter in the book um, about myself. So now I decide I'm going to run for San Jose City Council. It's uh, 2000. Uh, there's no incumbent, so it's easy to run. I've done a lot of neighborhood work. I'm president of the Neighborhood Association. I'm president of the Library Association. I'm president of the Park Association. I am the neighborhood guy. And so we can uh, have, uh, we run on a neighborhood, strong neighborhood uh, theme and uh, work very hard. You can see there the editorial endorsement from the Mercury News. Been very fortunate for every race that I've run in uh, here, I got the endorsement of the newspaper. So I'm really sad that nobody reads the newspaper anymore. But a, but a lot of endorsements. I mean, I've certainly been doing this um, for a while now and get a lot of support. <sighs> But homophobia raises its head uh, in a whole different kind of way. Not through literature, but door to door. Door to door. <laughs> it, was, it was tough. My opponent had a lot of very religious women working for her. And what they would do is that they would go down the streets, and when they would see a Ken Yeager for city council lawn sign, they would go up, knock on the door, and say, I see that you have a sign for Ken Yeager. You do know he's gay, don't you? And some people did, and some people didn't. And some people were great and said, yes, and I don't care. Go away. And other you know, people would say, well, you know, sort of tell me more. And they would have, some of them would have a copy of the book. And they would say, well, see, he, he really just wants to be a gay elected official. He doesn't really care about you. You know, the issues that he's running on are better suited for San Francisco. You know he does have a gay agenda, don't you? And so then you, how do you combat that? How do you, you run after them and say, no, I'm not that terrible person? Uh, so it was hard. What we ended up doing is calling all of the people who had endorsed my opponent, telling them what was going on, trying to persuade them then to endorse me. And we actually got quite a few people to do that and then able to be able to publicize it. And so I think that helped a little bit. I felt a little better. I didn't want to sort of be the deer in the headlights like I had been before. And so this is a uh, cartoon in the Metro that came out right before the election. Uh, which I framed, of Klansmen and uh, neo-Nazis, conservative people coming in saying, they're coming into my opponent's office. We got here as soon as we could. How could we help? Victory! 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 <laughs> I can't tell you how hard all of us work to make this happen, because I knew if I didn't win this, there wasn't going to be any other career in, uh, in politics. And so here we are, and this is the November uh, runoff, 54% uh, to 46%, and then Ken Yeager makes history again. So I'm going to go through some of these slides pretty quickly so we can uh, all go to refreshments here. But here I am now at City Hall. City Hall was at uh, Civic Center, first in Heading. Everywhere I've gone, it's the first time that a rainbow flag has been raised. So here we're raising the rainbow flag outside of City Hall. Two years later, we get funding for the Billy DeFrank Center, that some of you might know where that is. It's on the Alameda, right across from Whole Foods. Whole Foods wasn't there at the time. And then just recently, they got uh, the money for the Rainbow Sidewalk. And there we are walking over there. So now, in uh, 2004, gay marriage. Mayor Newsom issues marriage licenses to same-sex couples uh, for the very first time. A lot of excitement, a lot of joy. Doesn't last too long because, of course, what he's doing, unfortunately, is illegal. But, but San Jose very much, I very much wanted San Jose to figure out a way that they could sort of be supportive of this too. So we had several, we didn't have a lot, but we had several of our city workers who had gone to states where you could get married, and so they were legally married, but because they weren't sort of seen as married here, their partner couldn't get the city benefits that they would with a heterosexual couple. And so here I am with uh, Ron Gonzalez, who was the mayor at the time, very supportive of our issues, and so we then uh, have a measure that we approve employee benefits for same-sex couples. Well, just because with any civil rights movement, 
The same thing comes up over and over and over again. And uh, the chief of staff uh, for Ron, uh, Rebecca Dashowski, is there and remembers it very well. Cindy Chavez, who uh, was there at the city council and is now my colleague on the board of supervisors, was there. The whole chamber is packed, packed with people fervently against this, fervently against gay marriage. You know, it was the sort of the religious right coming out once again. And uh, you know, the, the meeting went on forever with all of the speakers saying all the terrible things that you can imagine, not really knowing how this was all going to go. But uh, lo and behold, then the city council votes eight to three to give those benefits to uh, employees who have been married. So things are good, things are good, except then there's talk of recall. That we know that the religious right knows how to collect signatures, but as a sign that I think that times were finally changing and that there just wasn't the political gain anymore for the religious right to be so anti-gay, I know they started the recall, but they never got the, enough signatures to make that happen. So now it's 2006, the incumbent county supervisor cannot run again. I've been re-elected in 2004, so I have a four-year term until 2008. But midway through then, I run for county supervisor. Again, some of the material that is there worked very hard. There are uh, three opponents altogether. Myself, Patty Mahan, who is the mayor of Santa Clara, and Linda Lazat, who is a, city, a fellow city, city councilwoman in San Jose. Absolutely nobody expected me to get 50% of the vote, which meant I didn't have to do a runoff. And perhaps as a sign that things were finally changing, no anti-gay campaign against me, none of that was happening. And so worked very hard and then was able uh, to win. So I get to the county and learn that the rainbow flag never been raised before. So there I am raising uh, the rainbow flag uh, for the first time in all of its beauty. Uh, several years later, we raised the transgender flag for the first time, and then we were out there. And I'm really very proud of the fact that the rainbow flag flies every day now in front of the county building. And it, yeah, yeah. I, I see it every day, and I still get a, I, I still get a, sh a, sh a shiver up my spine. I, I don't know what it is about flags, but in but, and seeing it, and just saying, God, that's great. And I think it's really nice that all the people who work at the county get to see it. People who are doing business at the county get to see it. So if any of you are working at high-tech companies that has a spare flagpole, <laughs> you, you don't have to wait to gay pride to be able to raise it. And then gay marriage. Gay marriage happens. Who knew that county supervisors by state law have the authority to officiate over marriages? So here we are in 2008, of course, when California, uh, for the short window of time, approves uh, gay marriage. And then to, uh, 2013, when the Supreme Court does it throughout the land. These are just some of the photos from the time and uh, the headline. Uh, but very exciting. In 2013, uh, there were um, hundreds of people coming into the county building to get married. I was able to perform 27 of those marriages in my office, and it was a great day. And uh, altogether, I think I've, raised, I've married about 150 couples. So one of the things that the county had done before is these health assessments from, for some parts of our community. And so when I became board chair in 2013, I wanted to make sure that there was a health assessment for the LGBTQ community, something that where people could really understand what our issues were. I also knew it was important to be able to document the, 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 what, what was happening in our community, to have sort of real sort of proof, because oftentimes if it's anecdotal or if you sort of say, well, we have these problems, but you can't sort of prove it, uh, if you want to get grants or if you want to sort of get uh, the issues addressed, it's sort of nice to have data. And so we did a, a lot of, of surveys throughout the community. We had focus groups, brought a lot of people together, trying to understand really what the main issues were in the LGBTQ community. And not a surprise to anybody, 
but you know, a lot of mental health issues, a lot of health care issues, a lot of people didn't feel comfortable talking to their physicians that they were gay or felt that they were being discriminated against by their, by their physician. A lot of issues dealing with, uh, with youth, particularly uh, youth homelessness, uh, issues about suicide, uh, many of these type of problems that again we know exist but we finally had sort of, if you will, real evidence and real reporting of it. And certainly we knew some of the really acute issues that transgender people were having. And so I sort of said to myself, well, how are we going to address this? Because county employees all have all these other issues that they have to be dealing with. And so if, if you don't really have a real programs and people in particular focused on the issue, you're not going to make any difference. And I certainly starting from the county level, you know, we have, you know, so many kind of programs where which intersect with gay people. I sort of wondered how they were doing in providing services. Were they being sensitive? Were they being open? Could people talk about some of the issues that they were facing? I didn't know, but I knew that if we had people sort of working with all of our employee groups, that that would be a good first step and also to have people in the community trying to get information as well. And so that's where we get the idea of creating an office of LGBTQ affairs. Um, I should say that uh, that's with me with uh, Mary Bell Martinez, who was hired uh, as the director. She came from San Jose State, where she did a great job and certainly has a lot of, uh, a lot of knowledge. But now we have four full-time employees with a, with a fifth person on the way who's going to really focus in on transgender issues. And so I'm really very proud of that because I really think it's going to make a big difference in the long run. And we are the only county in the United States that has such an office. Uh, Philadelphia, the city, has one, and the, um, Washington, D.C. has one, but we are just the third. And I'm just hoping that other counties, will, other cities will come and look at it and realize what we've done, and to be able to put the extra resources into solving the problems, because not having staff working on them just means everything is going to stay the same. Some cities, uh, San Francisco, New York, um, have started a sort of a getting to zero type of campaign. This is zero uh, stigma, zero deaths, zero infections. With all of the, the new medicine that is coming out, there's, uh, there's PrEP and there's PEP. There's ways not to get infected with HIV. I certainly wanted to make sure that our county was doing all it could to inform people and to let them know that there were ways that they could protect themselves, that it wasn't going to happen just by itself. I think we knew that a lot of primary care physicians didn't really understand what PrEP was, might feel uncomfortable uh, with talking to people about that, or a gay person might have a hard time talking to their doctor. So we really needed to create a whole campaign sort of informing the people about what, what PrEP and PEP were and ways that they could protect themselves. And so with the help of uh, Supervisor Chavez, we were able to allocate $4 million over three years to work on getting to zero here in Santa Clara County. You know, in, in so many ways that I'm, I'm lucky, I mean, I think a lot of people want to do good in the world to make a difference, but often it's hard to know exactly how you can do that. You know, in politics, you can. I mean, you have sort of access to money and to resources that you can put into projects that you care about. And for those of us sort of of my generation who lost so many people that I'm in a position to help prevent other people from getting HIV and going through what so many of us had to go through. And, um, you know, we have a mobile unit from the public health department that goes out to a lot of uh, uh, LGBTQ events and they do testing, STD testing and also HIV testing. And afterwards, or the next day or so, I'll talk to the physicians or the nurses that were there, sort of saying, well, what, what, what were your results? And it's, it's always great when I hear we didn't find anybody who, who was HIV. Um, but I always think just a little bit when they tell me, no, there was a young, young person who is HIV positive. And I know that there's going to, you know, that person's going to have a great life. There's, it will live a long life. 
But I, I somewhere in the back of my mind, it's go, damn, we weren't able to prevent that from happening. So very proud of that campaign. The other thing, uh, we're going to go through a lot of uh, slides here, and uh, one of the people that you'll see up here is uh, Molly O'Neill, who is our public defender. There she is. Uh, so thanks for being here, Molly. I, these uh, there are the 11 people that you're seeing here. Uh, it's great that six of them are, are lesbians. These are openly gay uh, people at the director level who uh, are out and proud and let it be known that they're, um, that they're LGBTQ. And I'm just, I mean, it just really means a lot to me that we are sending that signal to our other employees. Because I bet you could go to a lot of places and not find top rank LGBT people. Uh, we have seven count, uh, deputy county executives. These are all people right under the county executive. And three of them are openly gay. And I just think that is so important. And I just wanted to, for a moment, have you sort of see their faces and to also ask yourself at, at your company or your business, how many openly gay LGBT people are there at the top ranks? And if you can't come up with anybody, you might sort of ask yourself, well, why is that? Are they, they're probably there, but they're not out at some level. And, and why not? Do they think that it's going to hurt their... Uh, their job or their, their careers? Or are people nervous about coming out because they're worried they're not going to get promoted? Or is there something about the culture that is sending the signal that you shouldn't be, you shouldn't come out, you should keep that private? So here at the county, you know, along with the rainbow flag, really that we have these people in the, in the very highest ranks of uh, the county. Baymec, Baymec continues on. Baymec continues on. Uh, James, where are you? Why don't you wave? James is the president of, uh, of BAMIC and has now been for several years. And, and, and I don't know how she does it. Wigsy is still on the board. I think that's pretty amazing. But here we are at, uh, at a brunch that we had downtown not too long ago. And the fact that the organization is still, and it's the only organization that is still sort of fighting politically for the rights of LGBT people uh, endorsing candidates, raising money, supporting the people that support us. It takes a lot of work, a lot of time, but I'm just really very proud, 34 years later, that it still exists. And again, I think Wigsy and I tried very hard to lay the foundation to make sure that it was an organization that was very professional, did things the right way. And I should also say, and I really haven't had a chance to sort of throw this in, even from the early days, we knew that we had to build coalitions with other minority groups. That there were times when they needed us, and God only knows, there was times when we needed them. And so I think that's been part of really the DNA of the organization, and a lot of that is because even way back when, before Baymec even started, Wigsy was part of that coalition with so many other people. So, um, but it's great that it still exists, and if you want more information about Baymec, be happy to provide that to you, and they have a Facebook page, and they do all of that. So, glad that it's still happening. We're not getting a lot of openly gay people elected here yet. We still have a ways to go, but uh, Evan Lowe is on the assembly, and then we have three uh, city council members. Uh, we had a lesbian at the Santa, uh, Santa Clara City Council, Jamie McLeod, uh, who's our only uh, lesbian elected official. She was termed out. Uh, we have two folks that are on the school board, John Linder, who is here, and Omar T Torres, who's also a school board member. So we're slowly, slowly making progress. But again, when you think of where we want to be, we want sort of equal representation in government as well. So this is a, um, a page from the eBay website, uh, Be You, Be Proud. And uh, the reason why I mention that is it just is really very important to send the signal that your company is in support of LGBTQ um, issues and people. Because if you don't, people are sort of going to automatically think that you're not going to be supportive. And it's a little different now than what it was way back when, when there was so much hostility against people. But I think uh, sending this kind of message is very important and very proud of eBay for being able to do that, and even certainly uh, having me here dealing with um, the talk that I have this evening. Uh, 20 years uh, along the way, there I am uh, with Michael, my partner, uh, that is <laughs> in the back. 
Um, anyway, it's been, uh, been great to have him on the journey. So, so what is the gay agenda? Uh, as Yos and I were trying to figure out uh, the right title for this, uh, he came up with that. And certainly, you know, the gay agenda is often used in a very sort of demeaning way, um, sort, of, sort of discounting it, oh, that's just the gay agenda, or, you know, he, that's the only things that, you know, the gay people want. But for me, and I think for all of us, we understand that it really is a, a, a human rights agenda. That going back to Alistair McAllister, and just, you know, how, how he just sort of dismissed us as people, that we really... We were not full-bodied people, that we were only defined by our sexuality. And I think if you look back into, you know, into history, you probably find that that is actually true, that it's really only been sort of in the last 40, 50 years that we've sort of become real live people, that we aren't from some sort of planet, that you know, we are the, the children and the, and the uncle and the friend and the, you know, of everybody sort of around us. And I think the nice thing, one of the many nice things about gay marriage is it sort of then showed the commitment that people can have to each other, that it really was the bond that gay people really, in so many ways, but in different ways too, were like everybody else, and that we deserve the same kind of, of dignity and respect as everybody else. And as I was trying to write, you know, in the Mercury News 34 years ago, we were part of the community and we wanted to be able to contribute and to actualize who we were and to love who we wanted and to make the communities better. And so, just as I had to leave Riverside to come back here, to come up here, I hope that people growing up now can stay in San Jose rather than going elsewhere and sort of work on the kind of life that they want, have the job they want and have the families that they want so everybody can make San Jose a, a better place in, this, in the South Bay. It has so much to give here, there's so many opportunities, but I really think that if we can make it a, a, a very positive environment for people, that we'll all, as a community, we'll all be better for it. So thank you, thank you very much for hearing my story. I appreciate it. <laughs>